do a couple of things. Sorry, I'm uh, turning on so, the recorder just for grins. So I'm I'm not gonna I'm gonna mute in a sec. Mm. Sounds fine. Hey Bo, how you doing? Oh, I'm alive. <laughs> That's good. Beats all the alternatives. Um, and I was gonna say you and Arnie and I are overdue for some German food or something else. Yeah, Arnie's been up for it too, and Arnie's in town, so we've been talking about getting together with you. So, uh, oh, yeah. cool. Let's let's make that let's make that happen. Okay, that'd be great. We'll make it happen. Arnie and I are going through Shakespeare right now. You know, he's a big fan of Shakespeare too, and uh, so we're having a good time with Shakespeare too. <laughs> Can you map Shakespeare? What do you mean map? So there's a mapping of Shakespeare to British history and world history. There's a mapping of tragedies and comedies and some plays kind of point to others and some incidents follow others and so forth. Hey, Susan, yay. Oh, yeah. Arnie's doing that. You can be sure. Keep going. So I'm wondering what a map of Shakespeare's works looks like. You need to pose that to him. Okay. Yeah. So. I think that would be an interesting quest. Um, and, and I mean, the Bible and Shakespeare, the works of Shakespeare kind of are like the anchor points for a lot of Western literature and, and so forth. Uh, the, the white Western canon, so to speak. Oh, well, uh, yeah, Arnie's like, he's like, oh, Dante is here. Shakespeare ripped off Dante here. He ripped off Greek tragedy here. See, he that's that's what I mean, exactly. Yes, Arnie's got exactly. all that down and it's it's just wonderful, actually. <laughs> So, so I want to visualize that. I want that to be explicit and in the environment so that other people can trip across it and go, oh, crap, really? Because I was just uh, I was just in my brain this morning. I am eminently distractible. So I was updating what I have about the Umayyad Caliphate and how the Abbasids overthrew the Umayyads, but the surviving Umayyads went to Cordoba and basically created more Spain. Um, and they preserved a copy of the, 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 the Greek and Roman canon, which they took to Spain, then translated into Spanish right. later, but Arabic first, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I, apparently Celtic monks and the Umayyads are the reasons why the Greek and Roman manuscripts ex, uh, exist at all today. We have all of them. We have, you know, Islam to thank for, to thank for it That's right. as well as, as well as the Celts, I guess. And I haven't followed the Celtic story much, but apparently there's another copy that, that uh, somewhere that made its way to, to the Celts. Well, the Celts are also the ones specifically the Irish monks who uh, maintained uh, they could still read Latin and everything. And through the Dark Ages, uh, most of Europe forgot how to deal with Latin or anything. So Charlemagne rebuked the uh, church, the monks and the priests for you guys don't know. You don't know how to read Latin anymore. You don't know how to deal with this. And so he imported monks from Ireland to we teach uh, the monks of mainland Europe how to do Latin again. That's cool. So that that's I'm very anyone who's Irish could be very proud of that fact. You know. Yeah. So how is everybody? How's how's everybody's uh, Rex lives and etc. I want to ask something else though. A friend of mine. Um, yeah. There's one specific ruler. I forget. I think he was a German. You know. Anyways, oh, he went to the Pope and and basically argued that. Um, Islam had so outstripped Christianity that in the competitions for civilization, they were losing very badly. And, Christianity was losing. Uh, yeah, because Islam was Islam was flowering. They they were sitting there with all the works of Aristotle, and uh, the Europeans had one work, and so they had their their science was going everything. So they were very advanced. And Damascus, you know, was a wonderful place to be, or Alexandria, and. Uh, and the, and he basically this one ruler just said, hey, we got to we got to we got to catch up. We got to throw this puppy in gear. Uh, we're not going to last if we you know up against them if we don't do something about this. So interesting. And so you have that happen, and then then um, Islam went fundamentalist and just put a full break on it, even though they were far ahead of Europe, far so far far ahead of Europe. So the same thing happens in China. There's this famous, the voyages of Zheng He. I love that story. Which and is was a huge, phenomenal. Fleet yes. A giant, if you put the Pinta, the Nina and the Santa Maria next to That's like right. the flagship of Zheng He's 500 ship fleet. I know, you're like, I love this story. You're like, oh my God, it's like a dinghy. It's like they were in a little, like like Columbus was in a little like, like rubber dinghy in comparison. And they float all over the place. They make multiple mm -hmm. voyages. And then the next emperor calls a halt. Burns it down. 
burns it down, gets rid of the ships and says, oops, no, we're going to reroute this money to fight the Mongols, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and, and stops all this like progress and globalization that could have happened. Just, just, just like the, um, and who is it? Is it the Berbers? Who basically shuts down Islam? Ooh. How does how does how does Islam stop being this create? Because I think the Berbers come up, the, the the Moorish Spain gets crushed by the Catholics from the north and the Berbers from the south. Remember, actually, that all the, that's where we got all the books back that we had lost, that Europe had lost from from the Greeks, the Aristotle, yeah. because that was all sitting there in Spain. Right. Right. Um, so anyway, I, I'm trying to figure out what was the dynamic that caused that same exact thing to happen for Islam. My friend characterized it as they went to fundamentalism. Right. Um, well, the Wahhabis are kind of the, the fundamentalist sects at this point. Wahhabism is like the, the farthest right. of Shimei might know, might have all the answers, I think. Yeah, so the, Berber, the Berber question. Who, Perfect. So well, Shimei, we were just reflecting on how there was a golden age of Moorish Spain, and then it came to a halt. Uh, and Islam, all of and, Islam, all, from and, the, all of mm -hmm. it. There's also the golden age of Islam and basically Islamic scholars and all that. Um, and then also in China, you have the explorations of Zheng He and all of these things are ground to a halt by, by um, em emperors or rulers at some point. But why, how, and how did those things not survive them? And So Islam know. was far ahead of Europe. Remember, Jamei? They, they had... Mm -hmm. They had all the books in Alexander. They had all they had scholars. They were doing all this stuff. They were, and Europe was far behind. And then Europe got the books from from them, caught up, and Islam just stopped. Mm -hmm. But if China and Islam had not put them put the brakes on by themselves, we would be in a very different world today. Yeah, uh, look at uh, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, Years of Rice and Salt. Exactly, a, um, no, Susan, your uh, novelization. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. Um, Years of Rice and Salt is really good. And it says, what if the plague had actually killed off all of Europeans? Uh, how, mm -hmm. would that have, how would that have played forward? It's a really interesting alternative history. So the, the oh, Susan, you had a comment. Well, at, at the point where somebody said they did it to themselves, I said, just like we're doing it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the, the, common, the common thread for China um, and uh, Islam, you know, essentially the, the caliphate, uh, is uh, large-scale top-down authoritarianism. In Europe, you had hundreds of independent duchies and fiefdoms and, you know, and kingdoms and the like. You basically, you had no central coordinate, coordinated authority, and therefore they were all competing with each other and fighting with each other, and at some point, that kind that kind of friction prompts you know, triggers evolution. Um, whereas you had, you know, you basically had the structure in place in both China and in the Middle East for the top down authority to rule by fiat and put put a stop to things when they wanted to put a stop to things, and you just simply couldn't. You, there was no way for someone in Europe to tell all of Europe to stop doing. X, Y, Z. Because it was too many little fiefdoms. It was, it mm -hmm. was just, it was just too scattered around. You couldn't that, just stomp on everybody at once. You had to go conquer the continent yet again. Damn it. Yeah, that, that's talk again, again about Europe, that the, the, the massive competition between all the, the little states. And you think about, it, yeah, if you look at the Italians and all the things they did, yeah, it's again and again, you do see that. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. a great, that's a great point to me about the top-down authoritarianism. And another thing, I, I didn't really understand how the Roman Empire and how it, when um, the invasion started happening, how weak the emperors were. And in a hundred years, there was no emperor that died a natural death. And in like one seven-year period, there were seven emperors. And, that is not good to put and, in the job and, description when you're putting ads out <laughs> for the next one. And then I didn't understand that the, the, the emperors went to a complete totalitarian system. And then they had people like, prostrate themselves on the floor and call them lord and master and, and it became completely despotic and hydraulic despotism and the rule a micromanaging rule in fact and that preceded the dark ages because that didn't work it didn't work um but yeah the, that was the last stages of the roman empire which I, and as mm -hmm. and as susan was bringing into the conversation we are busy 
turning the U.S. into the handmaid's tale future, uh, launching us backwards into some crazy ass pre-civilization. It's very strange. And that seems to be like, uh, sorry, go ahead, Susan. I was going to just say it could be, I mean, if this fra fra yeah, fractionalization, <laughs> fractionalization continues, then uh, and we, we could go the way of states' rights, right? In which case we'd have feuding little states and or we could sort of break into those um i forget the name of the book jerry you should know um the guy who proposed that there are really really um nine nine countries in the u.s american right. nation nine, nation. That's nine, right. nine yeah. nations of north america yeah so that could that could be another way things break right because yep. these things don't just there there are pre-existing conditions and reasons why they break in the way that they do uh but is it true that everybody that well, I guess we haven't okay. figured out where authoritarian comes from and how to stop it. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, so, so, the thing, so is, what... the thing that argues against the nations thing, though, I love that book. Um, by the way, I just read a book on the Scottish Reformation, uh, the Scottish Renaissance, which was so fun. Adam Smith, Hume, all yes. that. So I mean, fun. that was an amazing thing. That's because they were on an, <laughs> almost an island, you know? I, that's I like to think of that, that they didn't have anybody an intellectual field that was so well established that they couldn't just invent their own. Oh, I, I can't wait to go on and on and about that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was really, the, my Scottish blood, I've been very embarrassed about it because boy, if you look up the opium wars, slavery, I mean, there, yeah, if yeah, something there are really some downsides. Happens, there seems to be a Scotsman there engineering it. Drinking. <laughs> and in that American Nations book, there yeah. was a point where Scots held the city of Philadelphia at ransom because they wanted to go after these Native Americans. And I just read it. It's in a nation's book. And it was so bad. They were holding the whole city of Philadelphia. What? And, and so even um, your people, what's that religion again? I'm sorry, Jerry, your people, uh, the Quakers. Quakers actually picked up arms to defend Philadelphia from these Scots. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> what? When? When? What? Right. what? Oh, I it's in American nations. I pulled it out and read it to my, my mother-in-law who was here. I'm like, yeah, my, here's 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 why I'm embarrassed to be a Scotsman, you know, my half Scot blood. And I pulled it out and there it is. Um, that explains a lot. I didn't know that. I didn't okay. know that at all. You didn't know what? <laughs> Your Scots blood. <laughs> yeah. That's my southern when you, my when you Scottish. Sorry, Jermaine. When you make the Quakers arm themselves, you yes, have gone really. too far. <laughs> That's right. It's true. Yes. Oh man. So I was reading that that Scottish Reformation book was so amazing because um I got to actually get a little pride and everything, but um they so many things are different. Um, their jurisprudence is not based on precedent. It's based on reason. It's based on Roman law. In fact, in Scotland, you usually went to France to study to study Roman law and then come back. So when they made the judgment on slavery, they to them it was a reason based thing. So they don't care about precedent. So they have a very different law. Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, <laughs> there was just so many things that were much more different about Scotland than I ever realized. And also the Kirk and, and, and the way that, they, so they basically engineered a kind of a humanism and softened their own religious stance and everything. And, um, and big property rights, uh, economics, mercantilism. I mean, all the things they were engineering and they also had a great influence on America when the revolution happened. Their, their, their enlightenment was going on real strong. So a bunch of Scots people came over here and like ran Princeton and basically provided like the, the ideology for the American revolution. That was really fascinating. Um, what is the name of this book? Uh, Go get it. <laughs> Jerry, you've met Joel Garou, right? I don't know that I've ever met him. I was just thinking about that. Because he was a G he was a GBNer, of course. Yes, he was. Oh, yeah. I, I don't I don't remember actually shaking his mitt. He was a New York Times bestseller, and I have to say it was really it's really worth it. And there's a lot of things I didn't really understand about Adam Smith, so I got a much more nuanced view of Adam Smith than I ever did before. Which book is this now? Um, how this? How, how the the Scots invented the modern world, Arthur. Oh. So this Thank book you. plus Nations is a re quite a way to understand sort of modern capitalism and modern america and the ideology of 
that we're living in right now because it, it was all engineered there. I mean, the Scots gave up their own parliament and, and joined the United Kingdom, but the deal, and it's, I think it's the best business deal, in, one of the best business deals in history, was they then got access to trade throughout the British Empire without restriction or, or tariff or anything. And so, I mean, it's the best business deal in history. Uh, it was, boy. And they then became, uh, it was like 14 days shorter to ship tobacco from Virginia to Scotland than it was to London. Also, um, uh, and I, I'd need to fact check this, but Glasgow was the best protected port in the British Isles from the Spanish and the French. Mm -hmm. So Glasgow becomes the central port for trade with the colonies. Um, and Glasgow becomes filthy rich. So you get the filthy tobacco rich. lords, you get everybody else. And one of the things that Adam Smith does not mention in his book, The Wealth of Nations, uh, is slavery. And it turns out that his livelihood was facilitated by slavery because he was a patron of the, the tobacco lords and other kinds of people. So he's busy creating economic theories that we base a lot of our thinking on, ignoring entirely the role of slave labor. Yeah. It's yes. kind of crazy. Okay, you, you derailed it for them. Yes, the tobacco lords definitely funded him and they were his buddies. And he made fun of them actually in the wealth of nations. Because uh, what he didn't like about the mercantilist system was essentially it was run by um, rich merchants who just kept making things for their own benefit, but then ultimately sort of hurting the whole system. So that was one of the reasons he was writing that. He was he thought that this basically insider-based um, corrupt government, very powerful capitalist combine was a bit, resulted in some really stupid decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing I didn't, uh, that the educational system in Scotland, because you know the Protestants wanting everybody to read the Bible, they had a higher level of education than anyone in Europe. So I didn't know that. Hmm. Um, it just, just sort of like America and the Puritans, everybody had to go to school so you could read the Bible. Um, that was fascinating to me. And another thing was, is like in the best doctors in the world came from Scotland because at Oxford and Cambridge, um, it was uh, dairy care for a doctor to actually touch a patient. There were barber surgeons. You didn't touch the patient. Um, whereas in Scotland, they insisted on basically practical plus theoretical. You did touch the patient. You became an actual practitioner. Uh, so I did so many differences between Scotland and England. I just never knew. So barber surgeon thing doesn't make sense to me because barber surgeon is like you would do bloodletting or leeching or whatever else when you went and got your shave uh, or to tooth pulling too, uh, which well, is the, which is why the barber pole is red and white. Basically, the doctors at Oxford and Cambridge, it was involved in a theoretic exercise and then somebody else did the dirty work. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <sighs> No, the barber pole is, is blood that, that they, they used to do. They used to have strips of linen that you know, as bandages that they would dry out. They would wash them and reuse them. So they would sort of wrap them around a pole and they would be nice and red over time. So, yeah, I learned a lot about Scotland. I was able to get a, a little bit more, uh, less shame about all the things they've done. <laughs> yeah. And that, so yeah, uh, you know, i.e. slavery, the opium wars. <laughs> Etc. 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 So to bring us haggis, to the, haggis, yes. Um, to bring us into the presence a little bit more, um, I'm very interested that Putin and Trump might, maybe, long stretch and wishful thinking, be meeting their comeuppance simultaneously in different ways around the globe. Anybody feel like that's sort of happening? I, I feel like both of them are trapped in extremely elaborate, expensive, dangerous systems that they're going to have a very hard time escaping, both of them. Yeah. I think both of them basically have their arm in the trap and it's tugging them in and tugging them in and tugging them in and eventually they both get wiped out somehow. I don't know how, but anybody else feel that optimistic? Jamey, it sounds like you might. 50-50, uh, I think Putin Putin is, is uh Posed? Probably on his Is way. that the technical term? Yeah. Um, whereas, if you, to, to extend your analogy of the arm caught in the trap, uh, Trump will somehow manage to chew off his arm. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, th you know, there are three scenarios for for the Trump situation. Um, one of them is he's not indicted, and it's real, and the result is relatively calm in the in the short term, but very bad for 
our society in, in medium to longer term. There's the scenario that he is indicted and is convicted, which is very, which is probably very violent in the short term, but ultimately good for society and, and uh, our, our governance. And then there's the nightmare scenario where he is indicted and not convicted where he gets to trumpet that he was proven innocent and you know that he you know that he never did anything wrong because they couldn't even convict him and you basically you get all the upfront violence and then you get the smug mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i think ultimately that is the, the the worst of the three scenarios um in order to avoid that, and I think that's recognized that, that the, the Democrats recognize that. And so I think it's actually more likely that he's not indicted unless they can just absolutely 150% nail him. Mm -hmm. And uh, now they're trying, they're really digging up the evidence. You saw that Mike Lindell had his phone <laughs> grabbed at a Hardee's. <laughs> or, or an Arby's. It's conflicting stories now. I don't know. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, you know, it may just be West Coast, East Coast. Things. They I sound alike, Arby's. too. Hardy's, yeah. Arby's. I don't know. Don't forget about either way. The one I've been, uh, I've been really, uh, I, I don't like to obsess on politics, but because of, you know, Russia is a big deal for economics and investing. Mm. And the Economist has been having these um, sessions, uh, Zoom sessions, where with their editors and and they're really good. They have a defense editor. They've got a, a Russian editor, a guy who was in Russia and now is in Ukraine. You know, so they they got amazing coverage. And the one thing they keep pointing out is that one thing about Putin's fall is you do not know who will fill the power vacuum. Right. So do not just take that as oh great we're scot free. Well, also like ooh, like any ooh. like any good despot he has decimated the ranks of the military and the political opposition like 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 he's killed or put everybody in jail um and so so it's unclear like who manages to survive and jump back in and people like navalny you know pre becoming a martyr to putin navalny was like kind of an asshole not 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 the best guy you want in charge of russia either necessarily another big risk is the but no i don't know if it's a risk, the further atomization of the remaining russian state right mm -hmm. you know, which might be fine, but I mean, yeah, they, I think they, this might be the, the end of their world. The world history of Russia's impact on the world, this could quite literally be the end of their ever so, having an impact again. So let me take the other side of the thing I just put in the conversation, which is I'm having like a smiling couple of weeks here because it looks like the red tide of the midterm elections might not turn out to be a red tide. It looks like Dobbs might be the tipping point that just gets a lot of new people out to vote and that there isn't a complete and total wipe out of the Democratic Party, which they also sort of need, like the Republicans need it. Um, and then Ukraine just really rocking kicked ass in, uh, in Kharkiv in just in the last two weeks and took back a tremendous piece of territory and down in Kherson basically has Russians pinned and trapped. Mm -hmm. Like, like there's a whole bunch of Russians and their supplies on the wrong side of, of, the, river. of the Dnieper and they can't get across. And I, apparently a bunch of companies are surrendering and refusing to fight and a bunch of other stuff. And I have no idea how Putin keeps the wheels on this cart because he, you know, I, I just don't know. So I'm, so I'm actually feeling kind of happy and hopeful that these things play themselves out in relatively good ways. Yes, there are um, major voices in Russia calling for Putin's removal. Yeah. Now, they are promptly being arrested. No, they're not all. They're, they're like, not like, all. Well, you're, not, you're right. Not all of them. But the council definitely... members who the council members who said he, he's like uh, should be arrested, he's committing treason, were interviewed on TV later. They, like they weren't like dead or had their nails, fingernails pulled out or anything like that. Now they might accidentally fall out the window. And they should they should keep yeah. clear of all balconies and windows. That's for sure. Like even yeah. I would avoid elevators in the in, on principle. But uh, Mika, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I, I'm with you on the the glimmers of optimism, but uh, you know, I personally, it, it'd be fun to come back a month or two from now and, mm. and uh, sort of play back the moment. Um, we'll have another call in a month. And we'll have exactly that opportunity. I, I, I mean, I'm sitting here, you know. Uh, listening and also mulling what I was going to write about today. And, you know, 
just to 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 uh, blurry up the picture a little. Good. You know, inflation has not been tamed. The market took a big dive yesterday, and we know that means the Fed is going to jack up interest rates. Um, and the there's going to be a lot of layoffs. You know, people are going to start hearing about that. Um, the national rail strike could happen uh, as early as Friday, um, and um, that will sow a fair amount of chaos into supply chains and just generally consumer confidence, right? So your point about the weakening red tide is related to this sense of people having more or less absorbed what's going on with the economy. And now they're focusing more on, you know, the threat to freedom represented by Dobbs or uh, represented by, you know, the far right candidates uh, that are all over the ballot. Um, and, you know, Lindsey Graham putting forward an abortion ban and getting slapped down for it. But A, you know, I'm always nervous, a little nervous about polling. Mm -hmm. um, we know that uh, the Trump Republicans are less responsive in polling. So there may be an undercount. Um, so, you know, when Biden said we're at an inflection point, <laughs> uh in his speech um i mean you know lots of things could could go the wrong way uh you know putin could decide that um he has to show that he's still the biggest meanest bully um and he's been holding back on using the full force mm -hmm. of his military mm -hmm. but now you know let's show them what we can do with a few battlefield nukes yep Right. So, so holding holding back, I think at this point only means nukes and maybe means some jet fighters. Except, th like he doesn't have enough army left. He has he has taken the best freaking troops, the famous ones, the, the yeah. Spetsnaz and the FSV or whatever. He's taken the cream of the crop, thrown them into battle, and they have been ground up and chewed out, like spit yeah. out. Right. But he has he's 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 much bigger and still can keep throwing people at this and most of the opposition that's being voiced right now is people saying why aren't we mobilizing even harder you know it's as if well a draft uh you know it's like uh when we were losing the war in vietnam and the right wing in america was like uh why aren't we fighting harder right um why aren't we nuking them that that was you know we had the same dynamic here yeah. Uh, it's not clear to me that if he loses that he gets replaced by, uh, you know, someone we like. Um, it's hardly clear who who could replace him. You know, that's the that's a big blur. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are a lot of, you know, ways that we're in this, you know, we're we're like leaves on the wind being blown around by forces way bigger. <laughs> uh, than anything we can do it much about. Um, I, I had a lot of friends who were on the White House lawn yesterday because uh, they had a big celebration of the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which doesn't go far enough, but everybody was like, God damn it, we got to celebrate something. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, if, if you would just let them implement the damn thing, you know, maybe we could make some progress. But... I don't know. I've been reading, um, uh, forcing myself to read Balaji Srinivasan's book, The Network State. Has anybody here looked at this book? Um, do you know who he is? I've got it in my brain. I've not read it. Yeah, he he's uh, he's kind of the intellectual, one of the intellectual uh, minds behind people like Peter Thiel. And um, he the the interesting thing about the it's a crazy book it's it i i'm gonna write about it next week and i'm still you know oh. only two-thirds of the way through um he has one you know really interesting idea which plays into what you were talking about you know with the history of china and islam and the middle ages and 
you know, which is that centralized top-down systems are, uh, you know, weaker than decentralized, you know, bottom-up systems. Oh, I'm thoroughly really familiar with this guy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. you are. You are. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you one more sentence on, you know, he, he argues that there are three power systems in conflict with each other right now, which he summarizes as the Chinese Communist Party, the New York Times, and Bitcoin. Um, and sorry, and whom? And Bitcoin. The third one. Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin. And that you know, independent libertarians <laughs> are you know amassing around the the world that Bitcoin will make possible. Um, you know, top-down authoritarians are looking at China as the model. If China really succeeds in controlling COVID and managing its population with intense surveillance, then they have an exportable model. And we live under the reign of the New York Times, which is where he's really insane. Uh, but apparently the New York Times commands uh, what woke capitalism then does to him. Interesting. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, Google, et cetera, um, you know, deplatform Trump is proof. Um, this is where he, he slides into kind of craziness. <coughs> but the, the idea that people, you know, are frustrated that the, you know, American democracy isn't really delivering and they want something else isn't wrong. Um, and it certainly seems to me that a lot of the money and dynamism to create something new is coming from the blockchain bro world. I mean, there's way more money there. You know, all you have to do is add DAO or blockchain to your idea and more people will come and, and pay attention to you. Um, and don't forget, he was a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Right. He is not a dummy. They're he's not, not a dummy. Not throw this he, guy he, away. Fact, I think he's a dummy. He's he's a he's a great synthesizer, but also, you know, operating from a starting point that I can't swallow at all. You know, I mean, I think he's insane, and also blind to, you know, the ways that racism and 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 capitalism work in America, uh, which is kind of wild to you know kind of read his analysis. You know, read from within his his worldview of where we are. Um, he has a whole interesting scenario for, you know, anarchy breaking out in the United States, leading to, you know, more people either being interested in the Chinese model or, you know, founding new countries. That's why the network state, the idea of the network state is uh, that, that virtually we're already seceding from each other. So why not go further and get those groups of people, you know, found a new country on some principle, right? Like our country is going to be a place where we only abide by uh, a non-sugar diet or something. And then you find all the people who agree with that and you begin to crowdfund buying territory. Uh, and then at some point you have actual land uh, and then you apply for recognition as some new sovereign entity. Um, and maybe, I don't know, the government of El Salvador recognizes your embassy or something. You can also go and found a new city and a state and say, listen, we got, you know, 300,000 people, this much income, but this is kind of laws we want. And you can basically shock governments. He talks about doing that, too. Well, I, that, that idea intrigues me a lot because it's, um, it's not far from what we kind of have already in that, you know, you can buy citizenship in different countries. Estonia has offered people did digital citizenship, right? But you're not actually getting citizenship. You're getting, a, a, you're getting a permanent identity. There are other countries that are actually trying to sell citizenship, but Estonia is not. The e-residency the e is not that. Okay. I mean, you can buy your citizenship in many countries, you know, right. if you have a, you know, put up enough money, you can get a passport. Um, Creating a new one is is the interesting part, right? Like, at what point does somebody like just go for it? Uh, to what degree are those islands that uh, you know, Necker Island and the one that Sergey Brin owns, but nobody talks about uh, uh, in the Caribbean? How much are they? Voldemort already? Island. I just it's called you uh, you 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 you. 
I saw the name recently. I was like, what? He owns his own island? Of course. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this, I've, I've tracked this guy a little bit. And it, it is interesting. But remember, I, I, one thing I critique I have of these DAOs, uh, remember, I think I told everyone the story a while ago about the one that a friend was involved in, and they decided to vote a whale out. And the whale was simply an early investor that made a lot of money. And then once they did that, the, the currency just collapsed 90%. The thing is, um, what, the strength of democracy are, are not just about, oh, yeah, everyone can vote on everything. In fact, our state works really well because we have tons of decisions made every day by experts that don't require the legislature approving them. Um, and actually, the strength of democracy is there's actually very much the strength of the institutions like, that make daily decisions to run things that don't require a vote on everything. So I think in a lot of ways, is DAOs uh, they celebrate the demos voting on everything when that's actually a weakness and very inefficient. And I would be a nightmare to live in such a state as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyways, Some of us do. What? Some of us do. Yeah. You mean, you mean are you well, talking about your community, Susan? Vote on everything. Uh, mm -hmm. Susan, uh, since you're leaving soon. Can no, we hear I'm not leaving soon. I'm only leaving for a while. Oh, okay. uh, at, the, at the top of the hour, she has to step out of the call for 15 minutes. That's all. Okay. Yeah. If you read the what she posted. Um, and by the way, for inflation, it's funny, Mike, it's so funny when you mentioned it, I realized I'm always thinking about it from one perspective. I'm realizing, oh, Mike is thinking about it politically. Ah, ah, ah. Um, so, of course, uh, I've been preparing for this inflation now for some years, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, it has come. Uh, yeah. One thing about inflation, though, to recognize is it never just does this. Um, and also what the Federal Reserve is doing has a lag. Um, and a lot of this is supply chain. So I'm frankly betting on the end of the year, I think this, you know, yesterday was a really bad day, but frankly, I think that it, it's actually gonna work out very well. And, and inflation is going to moderate for a while. And I also think the Fed can only go so far pushing on a string because they can't raise interest rates to the point where the federal government's um, t uh, t interest t um, payments are super high. Mm -hmm. So uh, I actually think the Democrats are likely to get a gift and they've already got a huge gift in the gas prices. I think politically, the, few, the you know gas prices at the pump is the thing which, which I think really hits the normal person. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. when, people, when people pay a hundred bucks to fill their tank that used to cost 60 bucks, that, that's like a whack on the head. They get that immediately. Yeah. And thank God the Democrats in the state, we're not facing, uh, we Democrats aren't facing what European politicians are, an 80, 90% increase in, en in your energy bill. <laughs> Europe is going to have one hard winter, baby. Um, quick question about inflation. The, the tech, the, what goes into to the basket that gets measured for the official inflation rate? To what degree is the spike in housing prices factored into the inflation rate? And what would happen to the inflation rate if that was removed? Oh, um, yep, that's weighted in. It is weighted in. And in fact, it, I believe it is. Yes. So it, it, I think it's moderating right now. I don't know the exact amount of the weight into it, but also the, the weight also includes um, rent, which um, which has been very bad, actually. Rent has been going well, up. Well, my point, though, is that it is, um, okay, a third of the value of the market basket of goods. Yep. Yeah, so if housing represents about a third of that, uh, housing, housing appears to be an outlier in terms of the actual speed of, of uh, price increases, and I'm you know so I wonder how much of the you know you had you had gas and then you had housing and I wonder how much um, uh, the day to day inflation is hitting if you take away housing housing costs. Well, I think also housing lags. It does. It takes a while to raise rents on people. Um, but so I'm afraid we're not likely to have good news. It's going to be continuing bad news to, to me from housing. Oh land... yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm not. I, I'm not trying to say that at all. I, I'm just trying to get a sense of what people's day to day experience of inflation is. Mm -hmm. it, you mentioned gasoline being, you know, a, a you know a key part of the day to day experience of inflation. But if that price is decreasing, what other uh, 
what other drivers, uh, upward drivers are there mm -hmm. that are actually playing an outsized role. Housing appears to be playing an outsized role, uh, but that's not something that necessarily affects you day to day, in part because of the lag, uh, in part because you don't buy a house every week. Um, so, so a couple a couple of days ago, I ended up going down the rabbit hole of the productivity pay gap, which is a trope that conservatives apparently hate and have tried really hard to undermine or get rid of, but seems to me to be kind of a factual thing. And it goes back to the famous diagrams that say, hey, somewhere around 1971, 1974, there was this huge split where real wages for laborers stayed level after that. And the 1% started sucking up all the money. And, and there's, there's a bunch of charts. And I read one objector from Hoover or Cato or AEI, and they were like, well, they're measuring the wrong things. And they changed all the metrics. Basically, you know, they said, well, you shouldn't take this measure, you should take this one. They be, and I didn't have time to sort of go look at what they were doing to the analysis, but it was like, it felt like they were sort of cherry picking to get rid of that, that anomaly in the data. Um, you know, let's just switch the metrics. Um, but, but, but at this point, we seem to be maybe at a moment where wages are justifiably climbing back out of the gutter and people might be able to make sort of a living wage, although at 15 bucks an hour, that's still not a living wage, not even close. Um, so isn't that naturally going to lead to a lot of inflation because it bubbles back through prices somewhere or does automation take care of that? Or like, it feels to me like th there's some long arc of justice happening around wage brutality that will play itself out as inflation as well. Um, yes, frankly, I do think everyone that the inflation is gonna be pretty much the rule of order for this coming decade. But the thing is, it doesn't just do this, it goes up, it goes down. So it's not just one way, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Wages will feed into prices. The wage price spiral, is, is the feared thing from the 70s. The return of that is exactly what every investor stays up at night worrying about. Because you're right, it will yeah. feed in eventually. When I was a kid in Argentina, at one point, they took three zeros off the currency. <sighs> and then when I was a grown up after grad school, I had a short project, like a seven week project in Argentina, and they were suffering pretty hard inflation. And I was getting a per diem, <clears throat> which was fixed. Uh, every two weeks or something like that, I was getting some amount of, 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 of local of local currency. And, and I, I received my per diem one day at the start of a long holiday weekend. It was like a five day holiday weekend when most stores are going to be closed. And I suddenly had the thought, oh, I kind of need to spend a bunch of this real quick now. I, uh, we were in Patagonia a, a few years ago uh, and went out to dinner one night. And um, I paid in cash, in dollars. And I happened to glance back at the restaurant owner uh, as he went to pick up the money off the table. And he was beaming with happiness <sighs> because he saw that I had left dollars rather than you know, pesos or a credit card. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, I, we have one friend who lives there who uh, uh, is a journalist for ABC News who makes his income in dollars. So they've been insulated from it, but his son repairs bicycles. Uh, and uh, as soon as he makes a sale, he buys another bike to fix because the, the money as itself- As as it can, for the price of the bike goes up, right? Whatever, whatever it is, it, it makes more sense to get the hard object than, yeah. than to let your cash slowly melt or quickly melt. Right. It's very. I would like to, it's really yeah. disconcerting. It's really disconcerting. Very disconcerting. Yeah. The, the, the argument in amongst investors right now is: is this the 1970s or the 1940s? I think it's the 1940s. So that's what I'm betting on. Is that this is the 1940s, which did have big periods of inflation but it wasn't as devastating as the 70s. I don't think we're actually heading to the 70s again. Hmm. And we also have a lot of pressures for inflation to keep going, because by the way, this geopolitical conflict with China, this re-onshoring of supply chains since the pandemic most certainly showed our vulnerability. 
Mm-hmm. Um, this is gonna it's gonna be more expensive to make stuff in America, and it's also gonna be wonderful for labor, by the way. And uh, the new act, the Inflation Act, right? Have the chips thing part of it, which you know everybody is very happy about. But yeah, yeah reshoring is going to cause a little inflation too. It's also going to cause great employment opportunities. I think I think sorta because I'm I'm I think that automation is going to factor into so much of the reshoring that there won't be that many jobs created by bringing work back to the U.S. Because automation's gotten really good at doing a lot of this stuff, like from soup to nuts, where what you need is like repair people walking around, not assembly people, and that I don't know that that has a huge effect. I really hate to tell you this, but um, so uh, the effective tax rate on corporate corporate profits has sunk in the last 50 years from 30% to 10. Right. Okay. You want to talk about political power? Oh, wow. totally. Wow. Now, here's where they increase the taxes on payroll. So, by the way, remember that's half paid by the employer and half paid by the employee. By the way, talk about making <clears throat> the workers pay. Wow. But guess what that does to um, uh, corporations? So any company, it means you want to minimize your payroll. So it's benefited technology, service, and, and banking, and finance. And if you look at this fiscal policy decision, which was made by both political parties, it is horrific what it did to employment. And it, it, you... It's undeniable what they did and for whom they did it. And I frankly, it's kind of turns my stomach. It turns my stomach, frankly, it really does. So yeah, that, that automation thing is pushed by that. When your main tax is from payroll, hiring human beings, what do you do? Minimize, 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 minimize. Get rid of all humans. You- I just shared you know? a, I just shared the the this thought in my brain because way back when I was like, hey, corporations do not like full-time employees. They're doing everything they possibly can to get rid of full-time employees. And um, I think pandemic sort of helped with that a little bit, but it's messy. Yeah, and, and remember, Trump even further reduced the marginal tax rate on corporate profits again. I mean, I, ah, ah, you, like if you really want to talk about there's rulers in a country and they just get what they want and screw everybody else, that's what they did. I mean, it's really bad. It's really, really bad. <clears throat> Um, All right. Let's talk about China, by the way. I want to talk about China because this worry about Taiwan and everything, that seems to be the next way the world can blow up. And I've been reading in Foreign Affairs and Economist about Z and the cult of personality he's building and this party Congress this year. And they're completely disastrous, zero tolerance COVID policy. I mean, the thing mucking up the world right now in a lot of ways is, is uh, wow. Does anyone have, I'd like to hear the group's thoughts on that because, Wow. Anybody have thoughts on Xi in China? To me? Uh, to oh. what extent do people... Oh, sorry. There's a go question ahead. for Jean. No, go on. Go for it. No, please. Uh, so so what's your what's uh, your current thinking on... I mean, I can't help but think about, uh, you know, how, how many people will die in China, right? Is it going to be enough to have an impact on the, on the um, you know, on the population there? COVID. Well, but right now they're not even inoculating. They're not using our inoculations, right? They have their own, which is inferior. And so I guess there haven't been a lot of deaths yet, right? But that's what I, that, I they're mean, tell, that they talk about. Okay. Right. Yeah, that they talk about. And then a friend of mine suggested that, you know, the Taiwan thing, you don't necessarily need to take Taiwan. You could just blockade it. And that terrified me. A new Berlin, and it's an island. Come yeah. on, you could blockade it. That's actually a very good plan if I was thinking evil. <laughs> so, yeah, you're, exactly. so you're you're she and you just watched Putin completely, yeah. completely fuck up Ukraine. What lessons do you take from that? I mean, certainly there's a lot of battlefield lessons that we hope they don't learn. Um, Taiwan has taken a lot of this to heart and is arming itself up to be a spiky hedgehog. I mean, you if, if, you're, if you're Taiwan, you want to be a puffer fish or a hedgehog or something where ingesting you is just going to be a nasty, nasty ass project. Um, so barricades, the right thing. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the PLA is as weak as the, as the Russian army. One, I think they have many more humans, 
who would probably like pour on like you could just overwhelm people by just dropping humans on the island but but less technology fewer weapons i think that their army is not as not as developed as the russian army the vaunted russian until recently vaunted russian army was then they have a great navy they've been just stomping money into their navy now for decades they got nuclear submarines they got aircraft carriers they got it all baby wait china yes yeah i think how many aircraft carriers do they have i thought they had one well they just got one big one but remember aircraft carriers are actually no longer the ultimate weapon they instead have been building those islands in the south china sea i mean that can't be sunk they get hit with a missile i mean that's a problem aircraft carriers are yeah. not a new thing they instead have been building static aircraft carriers in the form of islands shame you were going to say something right no i'm just nothing nothing of important yeah, you know, so I'm, I'm Z also, you know, he's he's in a kind of a weak position is the way the zero COVID policy and the, the regular folk are not happy about what he's doing to them. He's well, and them. just just to make things worse, China is going through the worst heat wave ever recorded and drought and crops are basically sizzling on the vine like like it's it's affecting harvest dramatically. And remember the way historically in China emperors, you know, they basically usually don't, um, <clears throat> they suffer violent deaths if uh, enough pain is caused in the society. And I think that I think that the Communist Party in China just thinks of themselves as basically the emperor for now. I think that's where they understand themselves historically and politically. So are there certainly any- Certainly the way he's acting. Are there any, um, are any of you hopeful about experiments going on with how we all should govern ourselves better? things that might go viral. I mean, one of the things that I think Balaji's book talks about is nations of choice, this idea that, that people might sort of opt into some other kinds of organizations that they, where they connect their primary allegiance. I'm kind of making that up because I didn't, I, I saw the link oh, in my brain and I haven't read the book. You got it, he says that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and, and so one of the big questions for me these days is, hey, who's going to invent the next really great kind of coordination and governance system that we're going to take for granted in 100 years? Um, and I think that the piece parts for that are on the table right now. I think that that all these funky things, whether it's NFTs and DAOs or uh, co-ops connected through whatever or degrowth and deglobalization or whatever, I, somewhere in that pudding are the piece parts that we're going to be living inside of in a hundred years and take for granted. And they're going to be, I think, considerably different from the status quo today. This is my own hunch. Well, one of the things I want to address what Susan brought up earlier about the nations and, and the breaking up of America. If America broke up like that, our, our world influence would just sink our, mar our unified market. I mean, it would be disastrous. Uh, for uh, us economically and politically, we would basically turn into some backwater bunch of- Would it? Not, not California. Yeah. Right, not California. I mean, California all well, by its own is the fifth largest yeah. economy on the planet, right? Wait, 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 wait. Okay. I think you dropped to six, but- um, Oh, damn it. No, actually- San, it, it, San it, Bernardino's it trying to, to secede, okay? <laughs> so that's an- <laughs> Oh yeah, so so, so is uh, don't worry about that. Yeah, but the, I think it's a sign that a county wants to secede from California. You have, but you've you had that, you've had the uh, um, you know they call it Greater Idaho now, but mm -hmm. there's been this movement yes. of in the Northeast for uh, secession of like Lassen County and you know a couple of other places that are that's been going on for quite some time. So that noise, that's just noise. Um, California is running a, a budget surplus, you know, and you know, we just announced that we're going to be guaranteeing free lunch and breakfast for all show students. offs, show offs. And, and then, um, and then give it, Gavin Newsom we're is doing busy, it. like, okay, go to abortion.ca.gov and you can get, get information. It's like the dude's like doing good stuff. Yeah. But wait, wait, but wait, a third Susan of the says. population in, 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 San Francisco was polled this week and they want to, you know, leave San Francisco. Yeah. And yeah. So they'll just, move. so we're just, we're mixing things up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, to go back to Bo's point, the, 
it, it's not so much do we get to chaotic, you know, uh, higher intensity conflict than what we have now, uh, but do we get to a, sort of a national divorce agreement? Um, and, you know, I, I can imagine a, federate, a confederated system where, you know, states sort of break into, you know, we end up with two major uh, agglomerations, the South and, and you know, parts of, uh, you know, wherever they wave the Confederate flag uh, a lot. Um, and, Alberta? And, yeah. And, uh, and then the West Coast and, and much of the Northeast um, and the land bridge being most of Canada. Um, I don't know. I don't know. We, we don't have to stay united to still be financially, you know, what does that then do to our financial importance in the world? Does the dollar, yeah. you know, we, we'd obviously so, have a complicated way of solving that. First of all, let me say I really like the national divorce language. It's mm -hmm. the it's the first alternate to secession and civil war that actually resonates. Yeah. Um, and it actually has a I think there's some cultural depth to it that um allows for a tense but peaceful separation. Right. Um the problem is Colorado. Mm -hmm. In particular, if you look at the you know the division of the state. Right. State, oh, right. state division, you have the West Coast to with some parts of Nevada and you know greater, maybe New Mexico, greater Idaho. Um, but then you have the Northeast and and then along the Eastern Seaboard. But right there in the middle of everything is uh, is Colorado, and it doesn't connect to anything, um, and it's just as blue as California in many in most respects. Um, yeah. But uh, the if you if you look at this map, it's just sort of wave wave hand wave away the Colorado issue. But you have the West Coast and the East Coast, and then you have a as a different con country the the center. Um, does that remind anyone of the Indian partition? Because you had East Pakistan and West Pakistan, oh, yeah. yeah, and then yeah. they had to you know the, it was just a really nasty period, and that's actually. A, a parallel that came to mind a few months ago to me is just the would we have a partition style situation in the US if there was this kind of national divorce mm -hmm. of people feeling that they have to migrate out of you know quote unquote hostile areas hmm. or the people were, or places where they're a minority or or they get badgered uh, to leave yeah no i think it right. would still be a bloody mess well, catch me up, guys. Yeah. I don't know about this national divorce stuff, but does it have basically? Do we act still like the EU or something? Do we do find some way to have some? There, there, there have been a variety of, of discussions. I don't think there's any one settled model. Um, you know, there are all sorts of issues around. You know, you mentioned finance, certainly currency and control of currency, military bases, um, ports and shipping. I, uh, um, I, I did a little experiment uh, when this came up somewhere else of sort of like, where are the nukes? Who's got well, them? The one, um, he, he, got, he got them in uh, the Midwest uh, or Western, uh, Intermountain West, and yeah. you have them on submarines. So basically both, both, both countries have, have a good supply of nukes. And some nukes. Well, as long as we both have nukes, we, we, uh, we're probably not going to destroy each other. Right. Mm -hmm. The thing I don't understand about this is like, you know, we're facing China. We would marginalize ourselves. We would basically, yeah. uh, it, it would be really disastrous in currency, economically, oh. militarily, politically. We would yeah. just, one of the, I mean, I don't know if you remember the 2016 like there was a big, California right. would be like the size of France. Go ahead, Jamaica. I was saying in 2016 there was a big Cal exit discussion. You know, should California secede after Trump was elected? Turns out that the major group pushing that idea in California was Russian funded. Mm. So, <laughs> you know, it uh, other parts of the world recognized that a split United States would be um, a depowered United States. Yeah, the, the other idea is to break California into five states uh, and probably you know get six more you know gain. Uh, a net six 
uh, Democratic senators. Um, yeah, I, it, it's, there's a kind of uh, way that the Democrats are the last institutional you know, establishment party in that they, they won't play with ideas like this. You know, while you have the opportunity, add DC uh, as a state, why aren't you doing that? Um, what's wrong with that? Well, adding a state actually requires a fairly, a, a super majority of other I states. I don't know it. about that. Derek, could you look, could you, do you have in your brain about how you add a state? Well, we used to I... do this all the time. I don't have a lot on it, but it's easy to look up. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, statehood for DC, Puerto Rico, a bunch of other things like that that's been in the offing. And then similar to packing the court, uh, there's been some conversations about just creating some new states in order to change, tip the balance in the Senate and other sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly the creation of our states. Uh, John Wesley Powell, way back when, famously sent Congress a map and said, hey, everything oh. west of the Mississippi should be states on uh, on uh, water catchment, water basin. Well, all it lines. takes is a majority vote in the House and the Senate, Jimmy. Really? That's it? Ma simple yeah. majority? Yeah. Let's go start a state. Come on, guys. And I guess that's one in the House, like two or three times it's actually majority, got a majority vote for D.C., right? It's just the Senate, you know, get get us one or two more senators and we can add and then we can add D.C. The bulwark, and we may very well get that one and two, one or two more senators. I am really looking forward to Senator Fetterman. Yeah, let's hope he's he's still compost mentis at that point. But yeah, we, we just I actually we, met we him a few to, years ago. I was on a panel great. with him. Yeah, uh, at, at really Bob cool guy. He's a very when he, cool back guy. when he was just mayor of yeah. whatever whatever city that was. But um, mm -hmm. yes, he he's uh, as soon as he gets into the Senate, it's great because they've already got a, a big program for uh, helping people who need nursing care. Well, the, the an argument for the that's a uh, joke for America. Oh no, no no Diane Feinstein's the joke. An argument <laughs> an argument for this nation atomization of America would be just what England did with throwing from the EU um, mm -hmm. you know, because that's rather recent and they basically cost themselves the same thing they walked yeah. away yeah you're right the, uh, no, by I, the, I like by the, the way, idea of, of like, us and we elites like someone like me was like nah they're not going to do it they're not going to do it but I am so surprised how often I meet educated people from England who are not nutbags who are like yeah out of the EU, I'm sick of it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, uh, it's really surprising to me, the cross-section of uh, British people who were all for leaving the EU, who are not nuts, you know? I'm sorry, I'm just gonna shut up now. Have you talked to them recently? You know, because how, how are they feeling about it now? The last, in the last year, I talked to a guy. And what, did he seem a little racist? Yeah, he seemed a little racist. Uh, his problems seem to be about the immigrants from Eastern Europe and his little town in England and everything. A lot of things he said were very odious. <clears throat> and uh, but anyways, uh, you know, I think people like us want to ignore these things and their cultural power and to sort of pretend they're not there, but they are there. Okay, enough. Sorry, that's a little depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to inject a topic into this conversation, if I might. Please, oh, inject about, away. I have to go away. And you have but, to leave, yes, but inject uh, first. Okay, well, no, I, I guess maybe, maybe uh, I don't know who's best to start with here, but Jamais, perhaps. Um, I mean, the climate is change is happening at such a rate. It's having huge impact on food supplies. And that will eventually have impact on the economy and it will have impact on politics when when one adds that to the current picture uh what 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 directions jamais do you see things moving in i mean suppose they i mean they will move that that will happen right can i have a little in, input to that because yeah, yeah. Jamais, what i'm thinking immediately about that is the the colorado river yeah. arizona exactly. Mexico. like those states are going to get hurt Bad. Well, New Mexico is different from um, Arizona in that it still has some aquifers. I mean, it won't 
you know, bail it out. But isn't that right, Jeremy? And I think I think so. Uh, you know, it, it is it is true that the West of the United States water does not come. Uh, water comes in rainfall, unpredictable rainfall amounts. Um, and, you know, we've, we've sort of used it all up, uh, what's underground. And all so, the water, most of the water they do get it from these huge federal projects that are very expensive. I mean, uh, yeah. these dams, yeah. everything. I mean, okay. Well, we don't know. Yes. So that, I mean, that could just break apart the West here because I don't know what, uh, I mean, people are still moving to, to Phoenix, right? Well, it's crazy, but and people, there's a, there was an article recently about why are people still moving into places where there's no water, no resources. Uh, but th that was interesting about Las Vegas that's been very good at reducing their water uses for what that was kind of, that seems to be a, a moderate success. Yep. And God, Las yeah, actually, there's been, I've seen some interesting discussions around water in California. Yeah. Uh, and you know, should we should we be investing in desalination that kind of stuff? <laughs> There's still a lot of room to to uh, reduce uh, water usage uh, from things like okay, you got to stop growing almonds. You know, almonds yeah. are just ridiculously wasteful of water. Um, to okay, Nestle, you can no longer dr drain aquifers at uh, at 1930s prices. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. The uh, you know so there's still you know <laughs> the number of people who still water their lawns is uh, unfortunate. All of that so all of that points to we have we have room to reduce how much we're actually using in a lot in a lot of western states uh, before we need to start embarking in something like desalination. But because desalination is well, it's problematic, but it's possible it's problematic because you basically dump a lot of salt sludge in back into the ocean which really messes up the ecosystem so that has to be done in a really specific way to you could form it up in little the, form it up in little bricks and put it on land in principle yeah. in principle yeah um so yeah but water water is the big crisis the I think what's going to end up ha having to happen in, in the West, uh, you know, California grows a major part of the American agricultural basket. I mean, pe yeah. people kind of forget that California, you know, California isn't California. just tech, isn't just tech center. It's also a you know major source of food for, for the, the country. In Asia, right? I mean, it's basically California is our Ukraine. Jamey, right? California, yeah, yes. The United States is Ukraine. Well, different different food stuff, but yeah. But Ukraine um, is our Ukraine. <laughs> they don't grow lettuce in Ukraine. Uh, yeah, but they grow a lot of wheat in the California. Of, yeah, the wheat and the yeah. rice production and everything is really quite. Ukraine strong. is a huge breadbasket. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um. I, but but Susan's right that there have been there were real issues around the heat with with California agriculture um, th this past this past summer. So there's going to have to be some adaptation to the you know what gets grown. I think that's going to be the biggest sticking point is getting the farmers to to shift their you know their crops. Yes, I, yes, I'll, Jerry. I'll just turn the volume up on on the topic we're on a little bit, which is. We've been talking about inflation and housing prices and what component is housing and and, and, um, and wages and so forth. But the but the big the big gray rhino that's like standing right in front of us is that we might actually be at that moment where climate disasters happen at enough scale yes. that they destroy a major piece of the food supply, totally spike inflation, cause a lot of people to starve, and cause major social unrest everywhere. Like like we could be in that little decade right now and and, yeah. and and given the last couple of years extreme weather like if you if you're sort of looking at it you're like wow these th there's really large events happening and a lot of people suffering a third of pakistan is flooded right now uh have you, you know, seen the satellite pictures it's crazy yeah it's and, crazy and don't, and don't forget that the climate crisis in the middle east and everything is driving all this immigration to europe i mean what about south america right 
I mean, Brazil and Canada, last I heard, were the two countries that have like an overabundance of water. Uh, the Pacific Northwest is happily like drenched. Um, you know, we'll be okay here, <laughs> but bleh, it's bad. And, and 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 then in the same breath, I'll say, um, solar power appears to be plunging in costs. Still, it's like you know, we we do in some weird way have energy too cheap to meter, in particular because once you've installed solar solar power in some way, uh, you don't have to pay for feedstocks. It just like generates. Uh, energy forever. And with unlimited energy, you could do desal. You could just throw energy, you know, hey, we have spikes, we have excess. Awesome. You could throw it at making stuff or uh, de desalinifying water any place. You could pull water from the atmosphere someplace. Um, there isn't that much, but you could do that. Solar is actually the cheapest form of energy on the planet. Yep. Two Currently. cents per kilowatt hour uh Some, you know something along those lines but and 10 cents yeah, per kilowatt it, hour is the the trade-off against coal yeah, yeah it you know wind wind is a little bit more expensive and then fossil fossils are you know a lot much higher up there yeah um yeah solar is already the cheapest form of energy uh you know the, the issue with desalination is not because of solar is not really the power consumption which is considerable but it is the what do you do with the waste material? And I, gotta, I don't know what the, I don't I don't know what the issue is of, around making bricks. So we take used sneakers and put them in road beds. We take like like there's got to be an interesting thing to do with the crappy, you know, uh, the toxic stuff that shows up when you do do desal. There has to be an elegant solution yeah. there. In particular, if you have energy to devote to it. So I have I have a oh, excuse me. I have an unrelated topic that's that it actually Please. has um I'm giving a talk in Sri Lanka tomorrow morning. Tomorrow are you traveling? I am not traveling. Uh I am doing this remotely. Uh I have been I was asked to give a 90 minute and I said no. <laughs> but it's going to be a uh a 30 to 45 minute uh presentation and discussion around um Bani and the uh, the recent crisis in Sri Lanka, uh, apparently as part of, as a, as a pre, uh, pre-work, pre, you know, a preliminary event for a conference in Sri Lanka organized by one of their big universities on the topic of Bani. Damn. Wow. Yeah. So you're like, you're like the keynote. Do they, uh, too bad you're not there. Actually, I, 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 am, I will be recording a keynote for, for the actual conference as well. Yeah. But tomorrow's a live, uh, live webinar event. Um, cool. It's so too bad you're not there in person because they'd probably carry you in in a palan palanquin or however yeah. you say that. Well, I don't know if I want to go, go to Sri Lanka right now. It's, yeah, it's exactly. been pretty crazy there. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so what's your question? I don't, know, I don't, I don't know a lot about how the what's hell going on in Sri Lanka. Do you have any idea how they even like got to you or? Oh what, God, what, no! Uh, Bani, is, Bani is a global phenomenon right now outside outside of the West. I'm I I get multiple uh, emails on a Google alerts every day every day about articles written about Bani. There is a. Uh, is the, uh, not the first Bani focused conference. There was one in Mexico uh, last year, uh, but South and uh, South and Central America, South Asia, increasingly now Russia. I'm getting articles about Bani, written by authors around around the world. Oh, it is it is a big deal. When I when I put Bani in to Google search, the first suggestion was Jamey Cascio Bani. Wow. I I uh, I'm impressed. It is it, it's totally <laughs> shocking to me, but this may end up being the the my um, legacy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's I but for for a lot of people, it has become a useful framing for a chaotic world. Yes. So when I googled Benny. The first hits, uh, well, the first hit is like the word ban, which is a monetary unit in Romania. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, none of the first hits are you, Jame. I think you need to correct this. Yes, really. They're, they're writing uh, about you and they're pointing to you. That's good. But none of them are like 
uh, I think you. Well, um, should be. Are you thinking? Uh, I know it's think, not. I know it's not the top leadership, one. Banny. Is that you? Uh, no. Uh, okay. Uh, and we're all probably getting slightly different results. But my first top results are all about Banny and point to you nicely, but none of them are you. Okay. Um, We've taken you off track. Were you yeah. hoping to talk about your talk, or shall we keep talking about your search engine optimization strategy? Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> uh, actually, it's really interesting because it, a few days ago, the uh, my medium piece, which was the the first public presentation of a first outside IFTF public presentation. Huh. Um, no, really. Do, does anyone have any kind of insight or? interesting perspective on what what has happened in Sri Lanka. Bo? Oh, oh, hold on. Oh. Yes, I do. Um, so they, they, so inflation really hit them hard. It's a small country that basically mismanaged their economy. And bye-bye, that's what happened to them. That's what they mismanaged their economy. With a terrible well, the military you know, leader elevated into power who you know, thought he could govern the economy by decree or something. So actually, Rajapaksa said, hey, all farms must go organic immediately. There was no supply chain. There was no thinking. Nothing was done. And it completely crushed the agricultural sector. They were like, you know. It didn't work out that well for Stalin either. Yeah. Well, yeah. But but I mean, he was looking at regenerative ag. He was looking, he was looking at good stuff. And I think he got sold on the idea and then implemented it in a really, really terrible, stupid way. Mm. I, I the the person who's the uh, who the organizer of this uh, webinar also suggested that the China Belt and Road Initiative might play a role in this as well. Uh, <laughs> so they borrowed a bunch of money from China for absurd projects. Uh, China wants you to default because China wants to own it. I mean that's what China's doing. This is their new imperialism, baby. Yep. And it's a very smart. So one. I don't, I don't, I don't know if you heard why this was relevant, Bo. You you stepped away. I'm giving a talk to a Sri Lankan university tomorrow. No, I heard. I'm very okay. excited for you. By the way, I did a search on it, and the first article I got was it mentions Jamae Bani versus VUCA, a new acronym to describe the world. Right. So VUCA. Yeah, VUCA was developed in the late 1980s by the U.S. Army War College. Uh, uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous as a way of uh, basically framing conversations around a change, you know, post Cold War, post Cold War world. And it actually was a pretty useful term. Business analysts loved it. Business consultants started using VUCA all over the place. It was a big deal at GBN. Um, Bob Johansson at IFTF uses it all the time. Um, Yes, Banny is death in Old Norse as well. Yes, that's actually, I knew that. Um, but uh, you know, VUCA was a big deal. But for me, VUCA, I started thinking about VUCA as, you know, we eat VUCA for breakfast these days. It is, it's the water in which we swim. And so it doesn't actually, that framing doesn't tell us anything. And so as things got more chaotic, in particular, after Trump really started to make, uh, make his footprint on global politics, uh, I started you know, turning around what what would be a follow-on, and Banny is what I came up with in 2018. Gave a presentation at IFTF at one of their 10-year forecast events. Um, and then when the pandemic hit in 2020, I repurposed that, you know, the script to that presentation and pu published it on Medium and just boom. Hmm. It's... Yeah, I'm on your Medium article right now because that guy put you in the footnote with a link right to your, your medium article. I'm super, yay, yay, Jamey, yay. <laughs> so what organization tasked you to come talk to them in Sri Lanka? It is a university whose name I can't pronounce. Nice. Well, good. Hopefully you can uh, school the next, the new, the incoming class of elites and how to run their damn country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it's been very interesting. It's it's a lot of business people, of course, are talk. I actually gave a big talk to Pepsi Mexico or Pepsi South America uh, on Banny last year. Um, 
an, a, an Austrian consultancy brought me in to do a webinar. Um, there is a Brazilian magazine around a, a new a new magazine that focuses on chaos that is explicitly tries to reference Banny uh, in every issue. Um, the guy the guy who's the main publisher of it wants to write a book uh, on Banny and Brazil. Um, and so, yeah, it it's crazy. God, it looks like Sri Lanka just did everything wrong. They printed money, run that, ran down the foreign reserves. Right. I did this organic thing. Oh my God. Ooh, ready. Nice. Ooh. Okay. Could, Mika, go. could you toss a link to what you're looking at, uh, Bo? Oh, it's just it was the Wikipedia page showed it. Oh, it's a wiki page. Okay. I, I mean I'm I just could... reading uh Jame's paragraph where he says it doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> at a surface level, the components of the acronym might even hide it, hint at opportunities for response. Brittleness could be met by readiness, re resilience and slack. Anxiety could be eased by empathy and mindfulness. Nonlinearity would need context and flexibility. Well, that's where I threw democracy in instead of, because uh, nice. I need a D word. <clears throat> and incomprehensibility asks for transparency and intuition. But... I'm going, search, I'm going to search. I'll search the economists, Jermaine, and send you articles if you want. If anything I find about them. Yeah, if there's anything that you think is particularly insightful. Um, yeah, I'm just doing a deep dive today so I can sound relatively intelligent tomorrow morning at 6 30 a.m. Yeah. Because, because Sri Lanka is 12 and a half hours ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, the half thing. Yeah, it's it's actually kind of funny, but it's exciting. At least you can give your talk in English. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is oh, so government mismanagement. I, Go ahead, sorry. I, I see that you have the ready. What I actually came up with was IRI, I R I E, and it's not it's not a direct one to one across, but it was a uh, uh, intuition resilience. Um, innovation, or no, no, uh, imagination and empathy. I think, it, well, intuition, I, I forget what the other I is, but basically, uh, I think the empathy part is a big deal. The resilience is a big deal. Those are the two that have been consistent. Um, but uh, isn't the, the reason to include something like democracy is because in theory democracies don't have famines um you know open systems respond better to catastrophes than closed ones in principle is, in principle um, said, right I, i'm not certain that that democratic or democracy is at the same no, it doesn't resonate. Um, pace layer, pace yeah. layer as intuition, resilience, and empathy. But no, that's true. That's true. Um. Anyway, so that's that's my immediate my immediate concern. Mm. Um, Exciting. But uh, yeah. well, there, there's probably a, a nifty <clears throat> consulting and coaching business called thriving with Banny or something like that, which is like, how do you make it through a Banny world? Well, jamming actually, um, I, I grabbed jamming the domains Banny, like age, age of Banny and Mundo Banny. M Mundo Banny is, uh, is a very common phrase in uh, the Brazilian and uh, South American, you know, more broadly South American uh, pieces. <clears throat> And there's mm -hmm. nothing they didn't do wrong in Sri Lanka. Wow. <laughs> Price controls, the, the, the whole like suite of bad ideas. <laughs> Poor bastards. How big is Sri Lanka? How many million people is it? Should be easy to Google. If we had a little listening bot, it would have told us already. Alexa, how big is Sri Lanka? Oh, none of you have Alexa working in your house. 
<laughs> oh god is that true 25 million really that yeah. and that's taiwan size it's interesting wow that's not small that's actually... not big either it's kind of an ideal size i gotta go guys i gotta get on a call with my dad's doctor <laughs> oh Bye, Mika. Man. no worries Good to see you. thanks Mika. oh Bye, Mika. well they're examining him now actually i i now i don't have to leave oh but okay anyway, we're almost done yeah we're yeah. we're right up at our time fascinating conversation thank you yeah, thank you. Um, and it, it, and Mika, it will be fun to check in in the next couple of months to see if any of this plays out. The How well it will play out. Yeah. Well, you know, two months is uh, will be will be post election. Ah. Yeah, I know. Wow, that's just crazy. It's an inflection point. Whoa. Boy, Bonnie, <laughs> with the climate crisis, Jamey. I mean, you got a book? Are you gonna? create a consulting firm and rake in the dough on this or what? I mean, I think Bonnie's just going to have more and more and more relevance to everybody. Yeah. Um, I know, I know I need to write a book. I know I need to write a book. You. All right. I got to go. All right. Okay. Sorry guys. Book in the offing. Um, what is there? Yeah. That was his phone ringing. <laughs> um, <laughs> A sound I haven't heard for a while, partly because I don't do iPhones. Yeah, Jimmy, um, do you want to run a global consulting firm on Bonnie? I mean, you could get your life could get consumed by this if you uh, let it. Yeah, which is why I don't. Um, I'm actually very happy to be, you know, Johnny Bonnie Seed, um, and uh, have it be an idea that becomes part of the conversation, as opposed to something that is a, you know, a branded approach. Um, I actually just viscerally like the idea of something I created having a life of its own mm -hmm. a lot more than something I created having a trademark after it. I, I agree. I could see that. And also, uh, your life could get the end of your research would end because your life would just be sucked up into doing it to running the monster. Yeah. Maybe a maybe a Bonnie tattoo, you know. Well, if someone comes up with a good symbol, I mean, I don't yeah. know if you, if you in the medium piece I used a um, danger of death, uh, yeah, that, symbol from that I saw in London. The, uh, I took uh, a picture of it in London. Yes, being yeah. hit by a lightning bolt. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I mean, the the actual the text below. It, I don't know if I don't think I included it in the in the image, but the text below that sign was danger of death. Yeah. So so what you might do is take take dude doing this and then re remember the gary larson cartoon of the crisis clinic which is basically on fire going towards rapids and there's some other disaster happening it's like like a real crisis clinic so take take dude and have lightning strike and then have nuclear radiation sign and then have uh st starvation like five different apocalypses hitting uh, uh, yeah, the black swan with radiation the black swan well, no, that's actually that's actually a bio bio weapon. Bio weapon. Um, and then, of course, I also have. Well, where did it go? Oh well. Um, well, that's actually really annoying. Oh, here it is. It's all on the floor. Oh, nice! I didn't know that there were three D <laughs> figs. It's a uh, you know, yeah. The, the this is fine. Not bobblehead. We got um, uh, not really a bobblehead. A what they're called. Anyway, we got dumpster fire ornaments for the last two years for our Christmas tree. Yep, that's what we need. All right. Any well, any, wrap, any last thoughts? Yeah. Any last thoughts? Oh, I'm just going to this fascinating article in the Economist where they're using uh, they they have uh, um, satellite photographs to show the basically the economic uh fall of of sri lanka oh wow wow yeah i'd love to see that okay i will send that to you then wow jeez <laughs> whoa okay all right i'll i'll do a, a bunch of pdf prints for you jimmy thank you very much you bet hey it's great okay. to see everybody again good Thanks, luck gang. Okay. same here see you next month Bye. Yeah. Bye. Happy, happy talk.